Gaussian random field about uh, the power spectrum which uh, for scalar perturbations, which uh, was more or less, uh, which is a constant for inflation. Uh, the potential perturbation supplies are determined by basically the one parameter that governs inflation, which is the Hubble parameter of inflation, which is nearly constant during inflation. So you get this, uh, what they call scale invariant power spectrum, which is uh, like a fractal, as I said. It looks the same, the relative amount of uh, fluctuations given a logarithmic scale look the same at different uh, logarithmic scales. And then we heuristically derive the matter of power spectrum from that, simply the Poisson equation, and maybe Alexei will do it more precisely. And the GR limit, this is simply the Poisson equation and the co-moving gauge moving with the dark matter perturbation. So you cancel out much of the, the, the potential psi and, and its variations and so on. In an equation similar to that in this gauge. You cancel these things out, so you're left with a normal Poisson equation. So uh, with the normal Poisson equation, you differentiate twice your, uh, your modes and you get k to the 4. And we said there was a flattening in this uh, dimensional power spectrum of matter perturbations at large k, small scales, because the modes that spend time in the moving gauge. And they spend time outside the horizon during the radiation era early on. They can grow, but they don't grow inside the horizon. The potentials are frozen both ways because of the conservation of the potential, as, as, uh, as Alexei was mentioning. Uh, at least outside the horizon, they're conserved. But the modes can grow. The density perturbations uh, can grow outside. They don't grow inside. So. There's a flattening because the ones that are inside are retarded, okay? And, uh, and we wrote it this way. This is called a transfer function that describes this retardation, that big modes uh, that remain outside the horizon can grow, and ones that enter the horizon during the radiation era cannot grow. So. The spectrum, the, the, the growth is reduced by k squared, k meaning the wave number, k squared uh, over the one over the wave length, two pi over the wave length. So the transfer function or the power spectrum is subdued by k to the four, so you get this flattening. Because this is k to the four, this is one by uh, this is uh, one over k to the four. Okay, so. Uh, uh, this is the main effect of what you call the transfer function that transfers the spectrum flat potential perturbations from inflation or nearly flat. They're not completely flat. They're, they're, there is a little uh, power law parameterized by uh, k to the ns minus 1, which you can measure, which is important. And s minus 1 being 0 is like the completely flat. And then the k to the 4, due to your Poisson equation, anything that is not k to the 4 in the matter power spectrum is uh, due to the transfer function. That's by definition. That's how people define things to do cosmology uh, or observational and, well, to uh, connect observation to k. They define a transfer function. The main effect is the lack of growth during the radiation era, which flattens the spectrum. There's another effect due, due to free streaming of the kind of dark matter particles you have during the, uh, uh, you are assuming. And it's uh, the free streaming scale during the radiation era. How much these particles can move, the co-moving distance they can cover at velocity v, which is inversely proportional to the square root of the mass. Uh, during the radiation era, which is like uh, uh, 40,000 years or something like that. Okay? So uh, for, uh, this is uh, important also for galaxy formation because it's like of solar system size for the standard weight, which the interacting mass of particles or GDP or more. 
and it's of the size of a galaxy for things like uh, warm dark matter and uh, hot dark matter, which is much bigger. It's, it's at least uh, cluster size. It depends if, if they were in thermal equilibrium, it depends on the mass. Huh? And then we have this schematic picture here. The, uh, this is another effect uh, the, on the transfer function. A third effect are uh, things like that. Diamond acoustic oscillations. These are very big theoretically here. So this is, we stopped here last time. Uh, these are oscillations that are very big. They're similar to what you see in the cosmic microwave diagram. But they're very big only if you have very large baryon fraction. They're small if the baryon is 5%. Because the, the, by the time galaxies form, form, photons are completely negligible because they go down as 8 to the 4 in terms of energy density. In terms of their budget contribution to the energy budget, they're negligible. And, and the dark matter is only like 15% of the total matter. Uh, sorry, the baryonic matter is only 15% of the total matter, notwithstanding the energy now, the dark energy. 15% okay. of the total matter. So the oscillations are small because the dark matter doesn't oscillate. And that's a big proof, or well, not proof, but that's a say, big evidence for the existence of dark matter. This is, schematically speaking, you take the galaxy distribution, like this thing here. It's not usually this thing. They do it from SDSS and things like that, which we discussed in the first lecture. Uh, and you do the power spectrum. You do the power spectrum by Fourier transforming your density distribution. It's a lot of work practically, but in principle, quite easy. So you Fourier transform your galaxy distribution, and you take the square and multiply it by KQ, and you get your power spectrum. And these, this is the observed, and this is the model. And this is says for BBN baryons, meaning for baryons that you get from Big Bang nucleosynthesis, consistent with the model. Uh, with the helium and beryllium and lithium and so on production in the early universe. And you, as you can see, it fits quite well. And it gives you omega n h. h is the Hubble constant uh, now in terms of uh, 100 uh, kilometer per second per megaparsec. So h is like 0.7. And omega m is the matter density. And, uh, and, and these are the, this is like uh, large, and this is small matter density, and this is the different baryon and for the baryons that you get from uh, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, you can fit quite well the observed galaxy distribution, power spectrum, which is nice because you started really with quantum fluctuations and inflation and so on, and you did all of this complicated mathematics that I tried to simplify in some terms to get easily the matter power spectrum, but it's fairly uh, sophisticated stuff. So it's nice that you get a nice result that agrees more or less with the supernova background data we did last week and with the CMB that we did uh, a couple of days ago, which gave you more or less the same parameter. OK, so that's why the model used to be called concordance. Nowadays, more they call it not the CDM data for reasons that I mean, Well, I explained because of the H node tension. OK, and schematically speaking, you are in the linear regime when delta is small, and then delta grows. And when delta reaches 1, you start forming things, dark matter halos that I'll, uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk about in a bit. And inside them, you form galaxies. This, this is the big schematic picture. So this is the full matter power spectrum from observations. This is not from, uh, this is not from, uh, this is uh, not the K cube, this is not multiplied by K cube. Okay, so this is this guy divided by K cube. It's customary for observations not to put the K cube. K cube, the dimensional power factor, is used more for theoretical physical cosmology. This is observers like the basic powers because that's what they measure. Okay, so they measure it from the CMB, they measure it from galaxies. They measure it from something called the Lehman Alpha, which are 21 uh, centimeter absorption lines in intergalactic gas. Of the, they are absorption because of gas between us and very far away quasars, say, thus something called the Lehman Alpha force, a different 
distances, it absorbs different things. And the, and the, the intensity of the absorption reflects how much gas there is. And how much gas there is, is connected to the potential wells that the gas is going through when we look back in time. Intergalactic gas, diffuse intergalactic gas. It does a forest of lines of different directions. 21 centimeter, but uh, absorbed in the Neiman Alpha, the, uh, the lines of the Neiman Alpha of hydrogen, and uh, that you all probably know about from a course in atomic physics. Absorption lines in Neiman Alpha, it absorbs fairly strongly. Uh, the radiation, uh, the, 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 the liquid hydrogen, and uh, you can see the lines and their intensity is uh, reflected in the potential wave. So you can get the power spectrum of the mass distribution from how the, the intensity of these lines varies. And you can get some idea of the power spectrum here. So, and you can get from lensing. Somebody was asking about lensing. Cosmic shear lensing, it's here from dark energy survey, ES. So this is the full matter power spectrum until things become complicated. At, this is the scale like of uh, clusters of galaxies today. This is the scale of the co co cosmic horizon. This is the furthest you can see. That's why the errors are very large, because we can't see anymore. This is called cosmic valence, halas, and you can't see any, any further than that. Uh, so it's limited by cosmic variance here. And it's limited here by the galaxies haven't formed and the physics haven't been very complicated. It's a nonlinear power spectrum. In fact, it becomes nonlinear here. But this is because these are recovery methods. So this is the spectrum starts deviating from the K Couture 4 transfer function. So it becomes nonlinear. Okay? So uh, it becomes nonlinear already here, meaning delta rho over rho is greater than 1. The perturbation theory doesn't work. Uh, but we were covered by all sorts of simulation methods and comparison and so on, and looking at higher redshift when it wasn't that nonlinear and things like that. And, uh, and this is why here the errors start getting bigger. Here cosmic variance, here complicated physics. Uh, uh, and this is the full power spectrum. You can see it fits the theory quite well, the lambda CDM, starting from primordial uh, quantum inflation, a scale invariant fractal power spectrum, dimensional power spectrum, the uh, key to the four, the transfer function, the amount of dark matter and dark energy, and so on. It agrees quite well with this with the observation. And somebody was asking about the, I put this because somebody was asking about the lensing. Uh, this is reconstruction of the cosmic density field lensing. This is the field itself in variance, and this is the dark matter as reconstructed by lensing. Who's asking about that? Yeah, so this is the lens. This is the reconstruction of the density field. And these are the galaxies, the variance, what you see. So this is dark matter, and this is the variance. Okay. So, and there are very small variant acoustic oscillations on that thing. Like the CMB, but as you can see, of the order of 5%. <laughs> the CMB are not 5%. You know. <laughs> They're big peaks, the sound waves. The sound waves are very small in the variant acoustic oscillation. And you can do with the variant acoustic oscillations the exercise we did with the CMB and find distance, angular diameter distance. Because again, we, this has the same, uh, uh, this has the same uh, rod as the CMB. Uh, it has the same, more or less, uh, uh, acoustic size, the sound horizon at recombination. This is also determined by the sound horizon at recombination. So if we think we know that, we can, and we look at theta of these peaks, which are similar to these, but very small. So these were discovered like in 1992, and this is in 2006. And th this is more recent, this picture, but they were discovered in 2006, confirmed. So uh, you can also do uh, distance measurement from the, from the size of these peaks. So you have another distance measure to test your your lambda CDM or alternative models with different dark energy or gravity or whatever. 
Okay? So again, this is the dimensionless power spectrum. We move now into forming galaxies. Okay? So this is all on large scales where things did not become very complicated. That the row over row is still less than one, what we talked about, until things like uh, like here. Okay? Like here. Beyond that, things are complicated, as I said. Now, why do they become complicated? Because clumps form. The dark matter starts to clump. Dark matter How does it clump? Schematically speaking, we had delta T, which is delta rho over rho, in the matter radiation, uh, matter dominated era after radiation. They start, the boat start growing, proportion to A, scale factor, T, Propor uh, proportional to A, proportional to T, uh, to the power two thirds. Let's say. When they reach one, and I'll try to show how this works out. When they, they reach one, things collapse. The dark matter collapses. You call it the top half collapse. I'll explain it now. You, 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 the, 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 you take an over density. It's initially expanding when the universe, then it expands less fast, slower and slower and slower. Then it starts collapsing in physical uh, uh, order. Take the center of the sphere, it would start its initial expanding in the universe, but slower, 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 then it goes back and, and re collapses. Why? Uh, because uh, the self gravity is, lar is larger than the surrounding. And it's called top hat because, like in jazz or rock, the, the symbol. That's why they call it the top hat. Okay, you start with this power spectrum forming small things first at large scale, small wavelengths, small sizes, then bigger one, bigger one as this goes on. Okay. Small and then big and then big. So the top half collapse is, simi is similar to the tuba <laughs> of our initial lecture on the first day. Uh, it's similar to that. Now, if the tuba, if you take this energy is equal to zero, if you remember we had an energy here, take this energy equal to zero, and then you have uh, a growth that is proportional to t over uh, 2 over 3. But let's say we take a matter-dominated einstein city universe with omega equals 1 flat, so e is 0. Okay, So it will keep on going forever with uh, a or r here proportional to t 2 over 3. Okay? That's the solution for this equation. You can try it. Put e equals 0 and solve that. It's r proportional to t 2 over 3. It's third. And we did it many times in the last uh, couple of weeks, okay? Now, put a little perturbation over density. What happens? It becomes a closed universe. Okay, because its energy is now positive. If I do a positive delta rho over rho, the energy is now positive, okay? So, instead of going as r proportional t 2 over 3, it goes up and it goes down. And it has this sort of parametric solutions in terms of parametric variable theta. So if, if the m enclosed is not rho naught, but I added the delta of r, it goes up like a top hat and then goes down again. Okay? Because if I put here 0 in a marginal universe, it expands forever, marginal. Put any perturbations, I have a closed solution. Okay? A positive energy, meaning the it's it's like a ball thrown up, not like a ball going to infinity. It's less than escape velocity, so to speak. Simple terms. Heuristic again. Okay? So these are fairly well known, they're called cycloid solutions. They solve this kind of problem. It's very easy to verify. It. Okay? It's, uh, it's really trivial. You just do the integration. And you get signs more closer. And these are the signs and cosines that you can parameterize your solution. Yeah. And you can check that this is connected to the dynamical time, 1 over square root of g the characteristic time of collapse. Right. So you can do all this now. So, so we have this on large scales. We keep our uh, initial density distribution. And we can verify the initial power spectrum. 
of perturbation. On large scales, the density, on very large scales, the density the fluctuation delta rho over rho, delta, is extremely small. On smaller scales, it's bigger. And let's say in the very larger scale, we can see it's 0 0.01 or something. On intermediate scales, it's 0 0.1. And then, on the scales where the power spectrum was large enough initially, things collapse. And they form clumps. They can, they can form clumps. So delta rho over rho is not 0 0.01. It's not 0 0.1. It's not 1, but much larger. How much larger will get? It? Yeah. Right? So you can simulate this whole process. Mahmoud uh, Lautigima. Oh. So you can uh, simulate this whole process. And it takes really large computers. Nowadays, the largest simulations are done on hundreds of thousands of processors maybe a month on it. Uh, it's really big simulation. You need hugely parallel thing. Especially if you thought later you put the gas on top. Then really hundreds of thousands and of and, so so and the codes are like huge, you know? Tens of thousands of lines of that. Huh? But you can do it. So let's start with the dark matter that is seeding all the stuff. There are simulations now that are uh, everything, but they're very uncertain, as I hope we'll have time to explain. But let's, uh, the dark matter is simple, because we're going to do the Newtonian trick to be smaller than the horizon, the Hubble sphere, and so on, where these things are bad. Nowadays, the people do put GR corrections, but they're very small unless you're going to go beyond giga The uh, GR corrections are extremely small. Uh, but they will be looked at. By the way, the GR correction with things like the SK and radio, 21 centimeter long, at very large. And we looked, the GR correction, whether the GR corrections, new horizon scales, are really GR corrections or not, <laughs> or some other theory. So there'll be a test of theories. But, uh, okay? so that, but, that's, uh, not, uh, but here I'm, I'm looking for galaxy formation. So uh, the scales of galaxy formation in Newtonian is very safe. The, 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 the errors involved are, are tiny. Or at least tiny compared to the errors and observations. OK? And in gastrophysics. Khalas? So this is a simulation. It's a bit old. You need to click on it twice. On the clock? So, not a big deal, we can do it later. Um, anyway, the whole idea is you start from the, from the fluctuations that you assume in inflation and that we did heuristically for matter perturbations. Uh, and that you can see in the cosmic microwave background. At least on the largest scales, you recover the power spectrum in the cosmic microwave background. You can't recover it on smaller scale, first because of the silk damping, and second because of the, of the peaks. You know, you recover the area, the, 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 the primordial power spectrum from the scene being the area where there are, where, where, uh, where there are no peaks. Uh, uh, because of the acoustic peaks, it ruins and stuff. But this is similar to that, except for the acoustic peaks, really, and on small scales. Uh, on large scales, they're, they're quite simple, as you can see. Okay, so the whole idea is to simulate from here to here. Uh, the video didn't work. We can try the other video. This is how a galaxy like the Milky Way forms in terms of the dark matter around it. It gives you an idea of the other simulation. The other simulation is more large scale. But this is on the scale of a galaxy like the Milky Way. As you can see, small things form first, and then they start merging and merging. So the, in the beginning, you have a nearly homogeneous system, delta rho over rho quite small, and then it grows, top hat like I said. But it grows the small things first. Why small things first? Because the power spectrum goes like k to the 4 and only flattens a bit, but still the small things are first. Not a bit, a lot, but still small things. Large k, small things. Lambda, 1 over k. Lambda, 2 pi over k. 
Large things, small things. The power spectrum was small. Small scale. Large scale. Small scale. Okay, so therefore if you do it again, small scales start forming first, then large scales and form bigger and bigger halos where the galaxies will form. Okay? This is called the Via Lacta simulation. I don't remember the exact people, but I think Cliff and the, the people in Santa Cruz, pretty much, I think. And maybe more than the coach. Okay? Right? So, so you need. Okay, so you need to fill in the sketch, which is more attractive than we saw the other video. <laughs> but really? Uh, how do we define this thing called the halo? These things that we saw forming here. Because that's where the galaxies will form. So we need to fill the details. What is this structure, EG's density profile? What are these things we formed from the quantum fluctuations? What are these dark matter things we formed from them? Uh, from uh, primordial quantum fluctuations that we turned into potential fluctuations, that metric potential fluctuations, that we turned into density fluctuations, that we turned into halos. <laughs> right? Now, what are these things now? We want to see these things or at least measure them. And we are, as you see, measuring them with lensing and things and so on. So, what is the mass distribution? This is next time, hopefully. Density is next, but and, and uh, how do we define it? And density is today. Mass distribution next time. Do they trace the mass, the halos, or are they biased? And that's something we'll do also next time. Do, they, do these dark matter clumps trace the mass? Do the galaxies trace the mass, or are they biased? Are they, when we count the galaxies naively like we did, and we get the power spectrum, and we compare it to inflation, and with the radiation error and, uh, and the Poisson equation and the co-moving gauge and all the stuff we did, are we in then comparing the, the right things to each other or not? Will the galaxy actually fix the math? Now this was a huge argument, less so nowadays. It's been settled, but it was a huge argument 20, 30 years ago. Uh, and how do galaxies form inside these uh, potential wells that are clumped that we call halos? And that's a big one. Very complicated physics. Not unknown physics, but very complex physics. And how do we match galaxies to halos? Hopefully it will be time next time. How do we match? How do we come to the number of galaxies and halos and simulations do they match? And which galaxies inside which halo? So that we can know if our dark matter model is correct. Is there a correspondence between this theoretical model in our heads from the quantum fluctuations of the inflation all the way to our galaxy, can we correspond them? Can we make a one-to-one or reasonably statistical, not one-to-one correspondence? Reasonably statistical correspondence. So these are questions we ask. We go back to our uh, to our ball. Simple stuff again. Goes up and down because we said there's an over density, collapses. This is all not true, of course, if there is radiation or if there is, uh, I mean, radiation is dominant or lambda is dominant or dark energy because this whole picture is, assumes you're marginal. On the marginals of being, you are a flat universe which is marginally any perturbation you put will be collapsed. It's not true in the other scenario. It's true here. And this sort of, it will only really happen very efficiently in a flat pattern dominated universe or closed. But it can't be too close because if it's too close, it will recollapse very soon before you get time to form anything. So it could really, practically speaking, only happen in the sort of universe we live in. This sort of thing. So it's interesting. 
Okay, so you get your side so uh, cyclic solution again. It turns around at theta equals pi. Are you convinced of that? At pi, you have maximum radius. If you're not convinced of that, then we don't. <laughs> There's nothing we can do. I mean, what is the maximum of a cosine? What, how many degrees in radius? Okay? It's in pi, right? So that's the maximum radius of this thing. I think if that's not clear, then we need to Pi, cosine pi is one. Well, okay, that's the maximum. And we collapse us to pi because that's, uh, okay? Okay? One pi is whatever. Anyway, this is, sorry, <laughs> is that minus, minus one? So, okay, so minus, minus one is two, okay. right? So I'm fine, minus one. So this is maximum radius, minus, minus one, okay? And we collapse it at one, r equals zero, okay? Are we fine there? Good, because that's important. <laughs> That's how you define your, your dynamics of the halo. And, and to get time scales and to match this picture with observations and so on. Okay, they don't do it exactly like that, but uh, it, nowadays it's done by the big simulations. But you can get, as I'll show next time, models from this sort of thing, and they are almost correct. You can, that's how you uh, call press check that we'll discuss tomorrow uh, or Wednesday. They can get models that will get you the halo of galaxy by, by some assumptions after that galaxy mass function really correct and you can test this stuff. Okay? So very simple things like that can go a long way if you follow them. Yeah. Okay, so how do we define this thing? Now if I have time tomorrow or Wednesday, I may uh, uh, discuss the virial theorem. The virial theorem is this thing I've been putting all along gm squared over r is more or less than d squared. You can get it basically by taking moments of the uh, of the Euler equations or gravity, the, the hydrodynamic equations of the uh, You can uh, you can do it by taking spatial moments. What are spatial moments? If you don't know that, hopefully I'll try to do it to show you how it's done. Okay. If not, take it like the gm squared over r we had is equal to mv squared. Kinetic energy is more or less equal to the potential. It's actually quite small. Who cares? For our purposes, for pedagogical purposes, it's fine. Okay. So when does this happen? Okay. Actually, I tell you, it, it, you should care because otherwise, in the energy, uh, it's unbound. But anyway. So uh, so when is this condition satisfied for this sort of? dynamics. It's satisfied, and you can verify that at 3 over 2 pi, and again at 5 over 2 pi. And a little calculation will show you that at these pi's, at these angles which define a time, so this is at first contraction, and this is after the halo re-expanded, you get a density of, the, of your collapsing sphere compared to the density of the background, the raw model, the raw average of the universe, okay? Equal to 147 and 178 times. This is when this condition is satisfied for first collapse and, second, and, and its uh, re-expansion, you get that. So people usually define a halo a virialized halo, virialized meaning in viral equilibrium. This, and the condition for viral equilibrium is that. Meaning, it stopped expanding with the universe, it recollapsed, and then became randomized its motion, and then the kinetic energy became more or less equal to the potential energy, so it could define a dynamic equilibrium. It's not expanding anymore or contracting. A steady state for a long time. Not forever, because the gravity is thermodynamically unstable, but for a long, very long time for him. 
many, many orders of magnitude more than the age of the universe. Okay? So, so that's how you define the head. 200 times the density of the background. In a longer CDN, because it's uh, flat, with a critical density, remember that you define and, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that we used for omega, rho over rho c and so on, that we call omega. Uh, uh, that this, we replace this by rho c, the critical density in a flat unit. Flat, spatially flat, critical unit. See, because it's a critical unit. Okay? And then you can define a viral radius, which is the radius where this is satisfied by definition. So this is the viral mass, and the viral density is 200 times rho c. You can define the viral mass and viral radius in terms of uh, this being this thing being satisfied. Okay. So important thing here. So we started from uh, uh, delta C. Well, this is delta C, 200 rho C, and this is rho C, and this is the real radius. Okay, so you can define the real radius in terms of where in your universe a collapsed structure will be 200 times more dense than the background. Bukhar Amal Noat Matar. I can uh, let's imagine uh, as a poetic analogy, you have uh, 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 raindrops that formed out, out of homogeneous cloud. And we want to define a raindrop. In our case here, we define it that it's 200 times the density of the homogeneous cloud. The raindrop will be determined by, by the electromagnetic forces that are holding the raindrop together. And it will, not, it, will, uh, it will be, of course, very different. It will have a strict definition. Here, the definition is determined by uh, the viral equilibrium, that it's held by self-gravity, that your halo is held by self-gravity in viral equilibrium. Raindrop, you define it by the, by, that it's held by the electromagnetic force. It gives it a characteristic density, much larger than this. This is defined by its being held by gravitational forces and in viral equilibrium consistent with the kinetic energy being gm squared over r, not ge squared over r, or something like that, e being an electric charge. Yeah. So this is characteristic of the gravitational force entering into the potential energy here. Right? So that's how we define a halo, a dark matter halo. It's relatively easy because the dark matter, by definition, does not repeat electromagnetic and so on, there's only gravity. And at this scale, it's only Newtonian gravity. Right? So if you can do, if you know that uh, cosine uh, pi is minus one, everything works out. <laughs> uh, right. So what's the standard picture of galaxies forming in this ship? <laughs> this thing. Okay? The, 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 this picture comes from the late 70s and early 80s. It's quite old. And uh, there are standard papers by White and Reese and White and Reese and Reese and, and Fall and Estacio and so on. Uh, some of these people are still active, by the way. Especially Simon White is still working. And George Estacio is still publishing. So, 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 some of these people are still around. Uh, Reese is more like astronomer royal and became Lord Reese. Not really. <laughs> He's doing bigger things. Okay. Not sir, but Lord Reese. Okay. So, uh, in this picture, small halos form first. They merge into bigger ones, like we saw in the simulation, the Via Lacta simulation. They make bigger ones. And then the gas. The baryons that we see formed inside. It started being accreted. Okay? Started being accreted. You have potential wells due to the dark matter, and then the gas comes in after these guys grow a bit. 
They, they start very small because of the power spectrum, then they grow a bit. Once they grow enough, what is enough is a question that is still being discussed. What is enough? But let's say they grow, yeah, I mean, of a size that is not infinitesimal compared to a galaxy, of a mass, let's say 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses, a million, 1 million, 10 million solar masses, things like that, you know? Then they can start accreting uh, uh, gas that can form uh, a galaxy. What happens to this gas when it comes down? The standard picture, now there are variations recently on that, like uh, what's called the uh, uh, cool flows and, and things like that by Nickel and this group and so on. But the standard picture of white and rings, which works fairly well in most cases, uh, is, uh, is, uh, is when the gas comes in, it shock heats. It heats to the virial temperature. Remember, I've been putting this thing from day one. This is the virial theorem in my, in my intuitive order of magnitude thing. And this is the heat equivalent of that. This is the thermal equivalent of this MV squared. Uh, this MV squared could be stars in a galaxy, it could be dark matter and so on. It could be also thermal motion in a gas, a molecule. You know, because P equals rho T and so on. And the energy is MKT. The thermal energy, the thermal energy, U. U. So you turn the, the motion that I increase, again, the gas comes in, the, I form the dark matter halo, and then the gas comes in. When the gas comes in, it comes with a speed because it's falling inside the potential well of the dark matter halo. I turn this falling speed into a thermal temperature. Okay? So the gas falls in and uh, heats to the virial temperature. Then what happens when I heat it to the virial temperature? It cools after that. First, it, it's in equilibrium, and then it cools. It can form, in this picture, either stars immediately, it cools very rapidly, and then when it cools, it forms stars uh, through genes and stability. Because again, anything that's not hot enough in gravity, anything that's baryonic, or doesn't have, or anything else that doesn't have a lot of motion, and gravity will cluster immediately. So stars start to form. If it doesn't have much angular momentum, it will form like a spherical or elliptical galaxy. If it has angular momentum, it will spin up like an zero saying about the, about the ice skater, conserving angular momentum, RV, R going down, V goes up. Angular momentum is RV. R being a radius, V being a speed. R cross V, let's say it's circle. Okay? So RV. So R shrinks because it's radiating energy away. Because it's gas. It's not dark matter, it's gas. It can shrink. So it's radiating energy away. It shrinks. But it doesn't radiate angular momentum because the radiation is isotropic all directions. So it radiates energy but conserves angular momentum. Shrinks, R becomes smaller, V becomes larger. So it forms a spiral galaxy. At least in the schematic picture that's how you get the galaxy. Of course that's not really how you get the galaxy. It's not like exactly like that. But as a first approximation it's not bad. Uh, there are problems because if you do it like that without any feedback, which we'll get to a lot in the next today and maybe on Wednesday, or if anybody has questions, because it's a big subject, we can discuss it forever. Uh, if you do it exactly like that, there will be too much star formation. It's called an overcooling problem. We need some stars to explode the supernova to meet the gas. I'll talk a bit about it. So in this picture, this is term, uh, uh, the, whether you get a spiral galaxy or a or an elliptical galaxy is determined by something called the spin or, or specific angular momentum here. Well, how much energy? You should get used to dimensionless numbers like that. They're very nice. They tell you when one thing dominates and when another dominates. This tells you how much angular momentum there is for a, for a given structure, energy and mass and so on. Okay? 
So this is the dimensional number. When very large, there is lots of angular momentum, very small numbers. So the like a Reynolds number in turbulence, if you ever heard of it. There are many numbers like that in physics. You can have a special session on it if you want. Num dimensional numbers that tell you the basic factor. Delta O over O is one of them, if you want. Tells you if it's uh, uh, negligible, then we are in the linear regime. If it's starting to collapse, it's one. If we are a halo, it's 200. If we are a galaxy baryonic, it's in the thousands. If you're in the black hole, it's infinity <laughs> for more practical purposes. Okay? So delta is one of them. Right. So, very quickly, what happens after this, uh, this, uh, all these galaxies form? Stars are exploding, things, and there is black holes that are accreting gas and light everywhere. So, you get something called reionization, which I will not speak in any detail about because this will take a course on its own, not a lecture, but a course. And there's a lot of work on that, but it's important. After the recombination at 400,000 years of the CMB, there's something called the Dark Ages. It's not, uh, what's he called, Shaka uh, Martel and, 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 and his son, Charlemagne. No, it's a, it's a Dark Ages, meaning there's no light anymore. And you can't see anything because there's nothing shining. The CMB still is coming to us. It will take 14 billion years. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, there's no stars or galaxies. And the universe is neutral. It's basically mainly neutral hydrogen, some helium. And then when, when, when stars and galaxies uh, 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 form, when the halos start forming, when you start having nonlinearities, and the halos start forming, and the gas accretes inside the halos, and the stars form, in the halos, there are lots of ionizing sources, meaning uh, sources with, uh, with the photons with energies larger than 14 EV or so, the ionization energy of hydrogen that we used for the CMB. So there start to be many ionizing sources. Okay? And then you have reionization. So this is from a simulation involving uh, Salim Zarubi and Thomas and, 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 uh, and uh, and then it Shardi and some people. So this is a simulation of the reionization process from Z11 to, this is the emission from neutral hydrogen. No neutral hydrogen here, a lot at 11. And this is the star formation history. This is what we, this is observed star formation history, which you can measure from uh, UV radiation because Recently formed stars, uh, they radiate a lot in ultraviolet. So by looking at ultraviolet, there are other ways, but this is the main method. So this is like 14 billion years ago, not much star formation, and then it peaks at the what's called the cosmic noon, when, when galaxies are forming lots and lots of stars, and then it goes down again uh, at our age. And uh, one of the big challenges is people looking, they'll be looking with the James Webb and, and things like the uh, Grace Roman and so on. In the next few years, they will want to know whether this continues like that, where exactly this starts goes to zero. Where are the first galaxies and stars in them? Or the reverse of the like So where exactly does this go? This is not negligible yet. Where is it negligible? There is discussion whether this is going down or is this still, you go back, you find it more and more. There's serious discussion about it. And the big galaxies is one of them, which we'll discuss some length. Uh, but there's other discussions. Okay, so the, the, in this picture of, uh, of white and race and Paul and Stathia and so on, in the, in the CDM scenario, uh, the, a galaxy is determined by its mass rotation, angular momentum, which is conserved, and the history of star formation feedback, which is really important, uh, because otherwise you can't make the galaxy. And this, in turn, is determined by the statistics of the initial fluctuations and how much merging there was. So you can actually uh, fine tune all that. I'll give you the final answer and get simulated galaxies 
like the ones uh, like the ones that are observed to a very good approximation, at least a, a z equals zero. I, I don't think it looks impressive. This is starting from the Planck fluctuations of inflation and the way we did the power spectrum and so on and all that, and producing galaxy, the Hubble sequence that Hubble observed in the 1930s on a computer. And then this is something called the Eagle simulation. But it's deceptive. It's impressive, but deceptive. Why it's deceptive? First of all, there are problems. Whenever you go to higher redshift, you need to fine tune your parameters again that I'll speak about to get uh, the right abundance. For example, you start finding strange things that some of you may have heard about in the news about big galaxies like a, a few hundred million years after the start of the expansion. We saw it with like, I don't know, 10 to the 10, 11 solar masses and things like that, even more maybe, yeah, the total mass. And you also get galaxies that shouldn't be there. What should be there, for example, from the Hubble Deep Field that I showed in the first talk, is galaxies that are still in the process of merging. Because we're making small things and they're merging and they get bigger and so on. You get a lot of irregular. What's a galaxy that looks like the Milky Way doing a few billion years, less sometimes a couple of billion years after the sun? So these are problems that are research subjects. Okay, and the halo profiles also look problematic. Now, when you do the simulations, you can and we define the halo, the virial radius, and so on. Inside the virial radius that we define of the virial density, which is 200 times the background density, you get a very characteristic, almost invariant density profile called the NFW after Navarro, Frank, and White. Okay, and uh, which is like in the log log plot, it looks like that. The density varies like r to the minus one in the center and r cubed further on. Now, not only people cannot explain it, and I worked on a bit of, on that, I don't claim I explained it, but, and many others, I don't think anybody really claims to explain it, because it's invariant. Why is it so and so? Can it come from some statistical argument or something like that? Not easy. But even more problematic is that it doesn't agree with all observations. Here are some observations from strong lensing on galaxy clusters. These are called Einstein rings, lensing rings. And they seem to agree to some extent. But why did the variance not make this NFW halo more steep? Why does it agree with the unperturbed NFW? That's a problem. Now, on the scales of dwarf galaxies, the problem is, seems quite serious. We, one of the reasons people put dark matter is that they wanted to explain the flat rotation curves at large radii. Why the speeds as a function of radius are not going down. So you put dark matter. If you put this NFW, and it has a characteristic scale, by the way. So the concentration here, the RS there, the inner scale over the total mirror radius is fixed by the mass. So for a given halo of a given mass, this profile is statistically fixed. You can't tweak it. It's part of the, of the model, you know, of uh, cold dark matter, even any dark matter almost structure formation. Any dissipation is meaning non-electromagnetic radiating matter will get you more or less that. Right? So it seems to me completely invariant, dynamical structure. At least for common cosmologies and the power spectra from the inflation model. Right? So, now we put our halo, we get our galaxy. We see it rotating, and it's not rotating fast enough. We put our halo so that we have uh, a rotation curve that is not a large radius. Yeah. Well, there's a severe problem that uh, it doesn't fit at small radius. We put too much dark matter in the center. So you can somehow, and people claim that you can even test the physics of inflation, the quantum fluctuations from this, from the rotation curve of a galaxy. 
like there was a pioneering paper by Liddell and Kamiakowski on that, which uh, uh, claimed uh, the power spectrum for inflation is not scale invariant. It has a cutoff due to some uh, phase transition breaking during the inflation that the inflaton doesn't go smoothly. It, it drops and so on. So you, you have a, the, the power spectrum is not scale invariant. It loses power on small scales. Uh, so you can actually relate the inflationary the model of inflation. You can choose between different models of inflation. But you can also solve it in many other different ways. Okay? So uh, actually what they did, to be precise, Lidl and Kamenkowski, was not this problem. There is another problem. Because small things form first, and the dark matter is really cold, and, and it's so Earth mass, the minimal mass. Remember the free stream you have on the free stream that we showed you a bit ago? The minimal masses of uh, Earth mass, then you have many, many small halos. But around the Milky Way, you can only see 10. OK, you've been seeing more now, 20 or 30. I don't know, the last count, maybe 50. But this the simulation gives 400 small galaxies. The Milky Way only has dozens, at most, of satellite galaxies. So where are all these uh, dark matter things? Why are they not making small galaxies? Little and Kamenkowski solved this by, uh, uh, by assuming there is a cutoff at small scales, at very small scales in the inflationary power spectrum due to some uh, symmetry breaking in the inflationary particle physics. Something like that. I don't remember the year. They didn't do the details. They just mentioned theories which produced it. And there are many uh, theories that produced it. Uh, and produced the reverse, where there is a spike in the power spectrum like uh, like Ahmed Morsi, they tell you about them whenever he's talking. Okay? Now, there are other solutions. You can have the warm dark matter, uh, which will not produce small galaxies because of the free stream, streaming length now is very large. You can have uh, self interacting dark matter. You, you, you bring this down by conducting, giving energy to the particles inside here. So that it goes down, you expand it by conduction. The, the, the dark matter is now not uh, uh, non-interacting with itself. It has a scattering cross section, so it's like a gap. So it can have heat conduction between the outer parts and the inner parts to give it energy to the outer inner parts and inside. It's now a gas, the dark matter. Not interacting with the variants in this model, but interacting with itself, scattering. Now, of course, this is beyond the standard law. This is a new interaction. Uh, there are many models that do that. And there are quite a fluctuations. Something I worked on a bit. <laughs> uh, the particles are so light that the that, 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 that zero point energy is of the size of a galaxy. You can't localize it more than that. So it has a global D wave map of the size of a galaxy. And a small map, a dwarf galaxy. And in that case, you don't have small halos because they die out. And there is baryonic physics. The galaxy formation process itself. And this I worked on a bit. So for example, through dynamical friction, we showed that very long time ago. But we are doing with Mahmoud something more recent now on it, these days. The dynamical friction is like friction of a tennis ball going through gas. It heats up the gas. And, uh, and the tennis ball slows down. In, uh, in, uh, in, um, in gravitational physics, these things go through the background of dark matter. They, they do gravitational scattering, like the tennis ball does inelastic scattering. This uh, with the gas molecule, this does scattering, gravitational scattering, two body scattering uh, in Chandrasekhar's theory. Uh, and uh, you have an effect that is similar to the tennis ball in a, in a, in a gas, meaning the tennis ball or the, or the sub-halo heel slows down, or the baryonic clump slows down, and the background expands because it heats up. So this is what we proposed some time ago, and it's considered one of the possible mechanisms of where you can do that, and we're working on it a bit now. Another mechanism similar proposed by uh, Few people, maybe most prominent, Anton and Governata, and we had a theory also how to uh, to do this stuff is gas fluctuation. So people, your thing, 
This is by a simulation uh, uh, of Justin Reed and collaborators in Surrey, which Mahmoud analyzed and we recently uh, had a paper on it. You can also drive out the dark matter so that its density decreases and its rotation curve goes down so that it can fit the observation by having gas that is turbulent and fluctuating and so on so that it heats it up. The gas because it's up. So we have a theory for that. It's, a, it's like a, a thermal heating of the dark matter particles from random stochastic fluctuation. Okay? Other people have different ideas, but we have like a theory similar to Shanga Sekar for fluctuations, but for power law fluctuation because this is Kolmogorov of turbulence, you know, it's complicated. The other, the, the, the shadow center theory is white noise, this is a different power spectrum. Not power spectrum for noise, this is power spectrum of gas fluctuations, you know, right? So that's not so Okay, so, you know, the, the, the power spectrum, not of the primordial fluctuations, like in inflations or dark matter fluctuations, but the power spectrum of delta rho over rho here. Delta rho over rho of a gas in a galaxy. So you can see the power spectrum can work for quantum field theory, can work for uh, uh, matter perturbations, can work for hydrodynamics, Fourier analysis, if you don't know it, you're using it all. Fourier analysis, power spectrum, random field, and associated stuff is really essential. Right? And because it, as you can see, from gas in a galaxy to primordial fluctuations in a quantum field, where you define the annihilation uh, creation operators from and the Fourier modes and all and so this if this is gone you, you are you can't do basic hydrodynamics and you can't do quantum field theory either. <laughs> so either you're interested in that or in this, uh, there's a lot to lose. But you can do observational astronomy, I guess. Not even that, because the you recover the power spectrum from observation through Fourier modes. So you can't do even observational astronomy, experimental. So you can't do anything, really. almost of advanced physics, almost. Okay. Again, so this is how it looks like. I mean, I don't tell you. So this is a galaxy is actually with exploding stars. So how is this gas driven? This is through exploding stars and so on, or active by galactic nuclei feedback. Stars form inside, when you form the dark matter halo, you have gas in it, you explode the, the stars, or you have AGN, active galactic nuclei, black hole, engine and so on and you heat it up. When you heat it up, it becomes like a fully turbulent medium. It's almost like heating, I guess, and becoming fully turbulent, meaning unstable, high Reynolds convection. Okay? And these are the fluctuations which look again like a Gaussian random field. But this time a Gaussian random field for fluctuations on the gas, not Gaussian random field. Uh, for fluctuations in the power spectrum of perturbations. These are perturbations in the gas. And we actually modeled it in this way, as a Gaussian random field, but with a color of power spectrum, not with a uh, scalar value power spectrum of perturbation, or the It actually goes to k to the minus 5 over 3. Very good. So, so, so the gas here interacts with the dark matter. Mm. Gravitation. It's coupled to a Poisson equation. Okay, so there is a lot, then we'll try to wrap up. Uh, there's a lot of gastrophysics, uh, which is a disease. <laughs> uh, gastro, there's a lot of things, then. This is an example of very complex gastrophysics changing your initial very neat and nice primordial perturbations that we've been speaking about yesterday. And that uh, we'll. Uh, Maybe Alexei will continue also. This ruins at the scales of non -linear. That's why you can't get the nonlinear scales very well. Things are very complicated. So, how do you model all this shit? All this stuff? How do you model all this stuff? You model it. The gas follows the two equations that we've been doing quite a bit the Euler equation and the continuity equation. But then there is still there is an energy equation. This looks complicated. It's not extremely complicated in principle. It just tells you there is continuity. The energy is produced. 
that this changes in a given small volume, the energy change in a small volume of gas is equal to the en enthalpy flux, meaning is equal to the flux of the energy plus the thermal, internal energy plus uh, the changes of energy due to pressure. DQ is DU, uh, DQ and PDV. DU and, sorry, DU and PDV. Okay. So this is just a conservation like this one for energy and changes in pressure, volumes, pressure, volume, and so And this is the gravitational potential energy. And that's it. But this is extremely complicated, the heating and cooling process. You have stars forming, they explode, they produce energy. Does the energy go into the dynamics or does it go into heat? How much of it uh, stays in the galaxy? How much leaves? How much uh, does the clumpiness of the gas, because it's not homogeneous, affect the whole thing? Uh, uh, what are the cooling processes? There's several atomic free molecular inverse Compton. Uh, cooling meaning uh, um, interactions that uh, uh, where a photon uh, interacts with a hot gas. So it, uh, it, uh, it's inverse content scattered from, let's say, visible into X-ray in the gas pool. Okay. Uh, so details of the thermal state, uh, fragmentation. Uh, then you have several sorts of heating, gravitational contraction, EGN, black holes uh, having hot gas around them, supernova, stellar, ultraviolet, young stars. Uh, how is the energy transferred? Is it heat, dynamical escape? It's more like ecology uh, so here than fundamental physics. Okay. That's a question you're asking in the first talk. But we have to do all that to get to that question. So in the very simple picture, you have angular, the, the white and green picture, you have angular momentum and you form stars inside a halo. You have a spherical galaxy. You have lots of angular momentum. You spin up and form a disk. And things are fairly simple in principle. And really, those, uh, the smallest galaxies tend to the seven solar masses, and the largest is like 10 to the 12 or, or 13 or, uh, or things like that. Why? Because these things fail. They will not accrete enough gas, probably. And if they do, they will just explode away, the gas. And these things are, uh, will be too hot. The gas for the shock seat will be too hot to cool and form stars in the age of the universe. Like you have a Baratje kettle with, uh, with, uh, with boiling water that is so huge, 10 to the 13 solar masses, that it will not cool in a Hubble time. So stay too hot in a Hubble time. So big and so uh, hot. Okay? So, but how does that work in the whole merging scenario and the whole process like that is a very complicated uh, story. And that's why people who modified gravity and so on, they find one modified Newtonian dynamics, which explains the rotational laws uh, instead of the dark matter and the merging. And say, they say, we can simplify all this a bit, even though they don't really simplify it, uh, because the CDM model at least explains a large scale structure in a simple and the cosmic microwave background <laughs> in fairly simple physics, not complex physics like this. So actually, they don't simplify anything, but they claim that they do. Uh, by saying, how come if this merging process and heating and cooling and all this stuff, and we get in the end very simple scaling relations of that. So we, 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 we get a scaling relation between the vol maximum velocity of a galaxy, where we should have the dark matter here that we, that we think is composed of the halo, and the baryonic mass. Why is this correlated with the baryonic mass, even though there is no baryonic mass where you measure? There's no stars or gas. There's very little of it. Why is it correlated? Maybe it's a fundamental gravitational law, not, uh, uh, not all this mess that we've been doing. It's a space and uh, time. It's a, mess. It's a fabric of space and uh, time. It's a, got a new gravity that has different fabric, yeah, and different whatever. There are many different formulations of it. None of them very successful in terms of space-time. Uh, 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 it's successful mainly in the Newtonian 
uh, limit like that. When you try to do cosmology with it, it becomes problematic. That's why the people who uh, want dark matter, not more, not like modified dark matter, this type, uh, uh, will tell you that we at least can explain very simply the cosmic microwave background, <laughs> the large scale, the things we know. <laughs> this is very complicated. Why do you come to not and to learn? <laughs> why do you come in the complicated part? Oh yes, this can be, that's why I say the rotation curves are evidence for, one, for modified gravity, modified Newtonian dynamics, to, be, to be clear, not modified gravity in general, to be precise. The CMB and the very simple stuff we did is evidence for dark matter. The, 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 the challenge for dark matter is to produce these very simple things from all the gastrophysics, from all the hideously complicated stuff. Okay, so that's a chance. They can produce it, but the scatter is so small. They need to explain why this stuff. Why are there these conspiracies? Why is scatter small? So they can reproduce it, but not the scatter. Maybe they will. They do reproduce, like I said, the whole Hubble sequence at Z equals zero. And they are brave people with brave computers, <laughs> with big computers. And we saw the Eagle simulations. This is another group, illustrious TNG. Led, if I remember well, Walker Springle and so on, I think. Uh, and they do, they put all the gastrophysics, they put all the stuff, and they come out with the galaxy. So they start from the inflation or with, from the CMB power spectrum and so on. And they put all, they do their halos, and they do the gas dynamics, and they solve these equations. They solve these equations. And they put all the stuff in it, all of it. It's called subgrid physics because it's below the grid size of the simulation. The simulation is on a grid, so it's called subgrid uh, physics, or there's another name I forgot. Now, but uh, subgrid physics—that's the main name. Okay, so so they put all that. They put star formation sometimes from empirical laws. Jonathan Freund, which was a semi student of mine, found, uh, not he didn't find this Kennecott Schmidt law, but he, uh, he uh, participated in doing plots of the star formation which generate with a time, and uh, not with time, with, the, with density of gas. So they can, to do the star formation, they put it empirically by hand in terms of the density, surface density of gas, okay? So they need a star formation rate to, to do these simulations. So they put the star formation rate. And then, for those who did any astrophysics, the, there is a, a, once you have a star formation rate, you have an initial mass function of stars, and you have something called population synthesis. How many stars are there for how long, and how many will be supernova, so they radiate back, and so on, and feedback, and all that. So they do all this complicated stuff. Initial mass function, stellar system, AGN, also black holes form, they start shining and feedback, efficiency route, and all the stuff of that. And even magnetic fields nowadays, they even put magnetic fields in the gas dynamics. In a simplified manner, but they put it. I think they lost this TNGL, and they get the Hubble sequence from primordial fluctuation of inflation. Impressive, but, de but uh, deceptive because you need to change all the parameters to fix it. And whenever you start seeing new things, there are problems. And the AGLs, for example, uh, they put it, uh, they light it for longer time that is reasonably observed, and some of the parameters are not very reasonable, some of the uh, pro uh, recipes for how the feedback is distributed are not very realistic, and so let's not get too excited, but it's very impressive still. But also expensive. This is very expensive stuff. It takes months on ends and hundreds of thousands of processing time on a, on a computer. He added an F in the computers. Blah, blah, blah. Okay? So very expensive stuff. There are empirical models we'll speak about next time that try to do this. Uh, uh, yeah. Empirical models that we'll speak about next time. Uh, First of all, you can do all the stuff in what they call semi-analytical models, putting it without a big simulation, just by hand, all these parameters I spoke about, and average it over galaxies. Just do the dark matter and put the stuff by hand empirically and average it over galaxies and, and, and tune your parameters to observations. 
Okay? These are called semi-empirical models. I will not speak about them too much unless any, anybody thinks they want to know about them. But empirical models just want to do the following. Suppose the models people are correct. There are no dark matter halos at all. There's only modified gravity. Then we will not be able to match the number of halos in the simulation at all to the number of galaxies with any realistic field. Can we match them or not? Can we match our catalog of dark matter to the catalogs of galaxies at different directions, and different scales, and different masses, and so on, properly, or with all the properties correct, or not? Because if we can match them, then lambda CDM is still working. If not, then we need to go back to the drawing board. Notwithstanding all the gastrophysics, notwithstanding all this very complicated stuff. So these are called empirical modes which match the galaxy distribution with the halo distribution. Our model of the dark matter and the, and the halos where the galaxies form to so actually observe properties of the galaxy. Luminosity sizes, uh, uh, even uh, luminosity sizes, uh, masses, uh, all these things. Uh, angular momentum, so on. I'm finished. <laughs> There is uh, uncertainties. Uh, there is